Welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Pania. Uh, in this episode, I am speaking with John Alexander. John is the co-founder of the New Citizenship Project that is uh, attempting to bring the resulting ideas of citizens as opposed to consumers into contact with uh, reality in the world. Um, he has a background and a career um, previously in advertising and made the switch to founding this project to try and really think outside the box of ways in which one could um, operate in the world, not as consumers, uh, not as subjects, but as, uh, as citizens. So this is his, uh, his project, which he is very passionate about, and he has uh, written a book on it called Citizens, Why the Key to Fixing Everything is All of Us. Um, and so that is what we talk about in the conversation. We start the conversation by talking about what is the consumer story. Um, when we talk about the history of that and what that's about and why we kind of operate in that way and, and why that's not enough. We talk about reciprocity and interdependence and how they work in a citizen's worldview. We talk about the subject, consumer, and citizen stories within current events and, and some of the failed attempts at the previous two and why the citizen model that he's um, promoting is, is the ideal. He gives the example of Taiwan as a case study of the citizen model. We talk about populism and the citizen story and how those there's some overlap between those two. We talk about whether institutional reform is possible and some of the pragmatic ways of having a, a citizen worldview. Uh, I have to say, this, this conversation operates mostly that way as a conversation, which, which I always love. Um, it's less of an interview uh, style and, and really just, um, you know, me trying to be as curious as possible and, and him being super passionate about his, uh, his project and his book, which is, which is great. And um, I, I really enjoy the fact that it is uh, more conversational. Um, and I think we, we really kind of, you know, poke at a bunch of different ideas and we can push each other on some things and obviously have a lot of agreement in other areas. And he's just an absolutely wonderful person, um, very, very passionate about humanity. And really, what I really respect the most is how much he's trying to find many ways of how one could live in the world uh, not as consumers, but but as citizens with each other in, in practical ways. This isn't just an abstract idea, um, but that he's trying to make it very tangible. And so hopefully when you listen to the conversation, you can hear some of that and, and um, get involved. And so now I bring you John Alexander. I'm here with John Alexander. John, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm very excited to talk with you about your wonderful new book. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really, really grateful for you to be here. Thanks for having me, John. Yeah, of course, of course. So just uh, tell people who you are, uh, what you do currently or what you have done, and um, just kind of your pot of biography a little bit, and then we'll, we'll get into the book. Cool. So, uh, so my name's John Alexander. Uh, I am the author of a book called Citizens, Why the Key to Fixing Everything is All of Us, which is a very unambitious title, as you will, uh, <laughs> as you will testify. Um, I guess uh, potted autobiography. I began my career in the advertising industry, which I sort of fell into really after having only ever wanted to be a professional athlete and not being quite good enough. Uh, and then... I guess the journey really has been one of asking deeper and deeper questions about what the role of that industry is in the world um, and eventually coming to a, a way of seeing it that, that is that I think I think advertising is part of a very core part of what I call the consumer story. And I came to start asking the question, what are we doing to ourselves when we tell ourselves we're consumers something like 3000 times a day, maybe more. And, and then to start asking another question, which was what would it look like to put that kind of energy into involving people in the world as citizens? And, and as a result of those questions, I, I staggered <laughs> out of the advertising industry and then uh, came to found a, a little consulting company with my business partner, Irene, Irene Akeshis, called the New Citizenship Project, which is, as I say, a, a consulting business that looks to help organizations of all shapes and sizes treat people as citizens rather than consumers. And 
and is where I guess I I would maybe now in some ways describe it really as a as a seven year research project trying to figure out what that means and what that looks like and 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 a, and a research project that is kind of for now at least culminated in in the book and the set of ideas that I'm trying to put into the world. No, that's it's it's absolutely incredible. I, I think you talk about it in the book, obviously, and you give lots of uh, wonderful narrative accounts and you, some of your own and, and, and other other folks. And um, yeah, the title was super interesting about the whole citizens uh, piece of it. And so it would be interesting to see uh, as we have the conversation, kind of how I can just from like the the writing, I could tell there was a you know big 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 passion, and I think it's a message that many people need to hear. My I guess much of my emphasis will be all on the applied pieces of it, right? How, how do we do this? How do we focus on this? But before we get there, we can just kind of start out kind of on the uh, big concepts first and, and where, where this stuff kind of originates. So I guess the, um, you kind of alluded to it, you kind of start the book out in the, the first part by talking about the citizen story and then the current consumer story. So maybe, maybe tell us the consumer story, which is what most of us are familiar with, and some of those issues and problems. And then we can kind of launch into the citizen story that you've titled. Cool. Uh, so yeah, so like I say, um, began my career working in advertising and, and, and really quite at the heart of what I, what I now think of the consumer story. So, so the story, as I see it, says, the right thing for us to do is to look out for number one, choose the best deal for ourselves from those that are offered, uh, uh, and and essentially pursue self-interest. That's the right thing to do because the basis that sits behind that is that, that self-interest will add up to collective interest, that if we all pursue our individual self-interest, that that will add up to the best outcomes for society as a whole. And I guess it, it what what comes with that is a, is really a conception of, of society as a as a as a marketplace as as something as of organizations of all shapes and sizes whether it's government or charity or business competing to serve our needs competing to meet the self-interest that we're seeking and sort of climbing climbing above one another to do so and and that that sort of rising tide lifting all boats and that kind of that kind of metaphor um and i think Oh, like just to bring it really tight, I guess I see the the moment in time we're living in really as being the collapse of that story because the 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 contradictions that are deep within it are kind of getting too heavy right now. So so we live uh, in a time of climate emergency and biodiversity collapse. Yet we are living in a story that says that the right thing for us to do is to uh, pursue self-interest and and primarily through material means. Uh, which is resulting in unsustainable material consumption. We live in a in, in a time of massive inequality uh, that, that's that's becoming ever more pervasive and ever more problematic, and causing ever more misery even among the wealthy. We live in a we live in a time when uh, characterised by pervasive inequality that's that's getting worse and worse and is making even the even the wealthy unhappy uh, and yet we we live we live within a story that says that the, the pursuit of happiness to quote the title of a film starring a, a certain individual uh, who's in the headlines these days is uh, the pursuit of happiness is down to material pursuit of material possessions and well-being and, and and achieved by consumption and competition and we live in a time when people are when we have a loneliness epidemic as well. We we have we are paralysed by this, and 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 yet we're telling ourselves a story that says that we're isolated individuals. And I guess that the the most profoundly and something I'd love to get into with you. We live in a time of of war and uh, and really big geopolitical crisis that I would argue is to a large extent driven by the collapse of this story, the, 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 the wavering and uncertainty uh, that we now have in the story that, that, that has shaped our, our, our world. And yet we're, we're trying to sort of keep that story going, keep it on the tracks rather than looking to renew and refresh it. And so I think, I think that's where we are. I think we're in a moment where the story that we've we've sort of constructed, and we constructed it very deliberately out of the two world wars, and 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 the U.S. is the home of this story in many ways. 
is that story's that story's broken and and unless we find a way to evolve through it fix it make it better it could take us down with it yeah what i guess my question is is twofold right so how how would you define i guess consumerism right how we understand it now and what do you think is leading to the breakdown of that, right? Of why people are dissatisfied with that, or why is that not, why is it not enough to to have you know uh, wealth or status or um, to have all the things, right? Why do you think that that's not enough anymore for, for or why are they dissatisfied uh, with this? So. I would describe consumer. I think it's really important question. Actually, it's very important to be really specific about what we what what we mean by consumerism because it's too easily just sort of banded around as a as a lazy term. Mm -hmm. What I really specifically mean is 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 the 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 society ex that exists when the dominant story of the individual is the consumer. When when the idea of the role that the indi individual should play is is the is the consumer. The, and, and so the society that exists, not just when we're consumers in relation to business, but when we're consumers in relation to government, when government is reframed as a public service, as a provider of services, and when our role in relation to government is to choose between options every few years, but not actually to get involved in shaping those options. Uh, and when our relationship to, to causes and charities is only as a donor or whatever like uh, to transact rather than be be a participant and i think to your to your equally astute second question i think that the reason why that's not enough uh and not working certainly is that um humans aren't that creature right like we we what we actually need most is is agency what we need is relationships what we need is each other and I think like one of the really powerful things and one of the reasons why I insist, I insist actually on using the word citizen for all that I acknowledge it has some baggage and some problems is that it's kind of literal derivation. It, the etymology of the word citizen is it means together people. And it's a kind of acknowledgement that, that we are inherently interdependent now just to be clear that's not to say that we're that, that this isn't and, and we'll, we'll go further into this i'm sure but it's it's not about sort of disappearing the individual we are all unique individuals but we also find our most powerful meaning and contribution when we come together and and get up to something together we we we, we work together exponentially not just not just side by side so in that in that regard is it that the <clears throat> Hmm. The the consumer story is obfuscating the ability to cooperate with other people, or that we're missing the humanity in other people, as a group and as individuals. Right. So it's not the fact that you know, if I want to have um, uh, you know, a, a new. Uh, Apple computer or a new Apple phone or something that that that's not a negative thing necessarily, but it's a yeah, fact of right. where is the emphasis, right? Or what is what is pulling the strings here of a person's uh, you know compass, right? In life, right? Where where are they headed to? Is this, is this demands of buying things and or being a consumer, as you were say, uh, stating? of other aspects such as with government such as with other uh, entities or institutions right and that the emphasis should be on the person right whether it's individuals or with groups is and so is is that the piece of it right is that when consumerism is obstructing the ability to uh you know not see the person to not see the human is that where it becomes the breakdown or is it something more than that i think that's part of it i mean i guess there's probably two things I would say. The first is I think that um, the idea of the consumer, like some, in some ways I would describe it almost as like a species level self-hatred complex, right? Like it's basically the idea of the consumer is rooted in a notion that we are we are by default lazy and selfish creatures that 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 that, that we and the the best that the good outcomes for society can only be achieved by channeling our kind of worst nature in some way. 
um, when actually we're we're by nature, I believe, creative, collaborative, caring creatures who who really want to get involved and want to contribute. And when we're given that permission and the opportunity, that's that's the full of things. So in that sense, I think yes, it's uh, it's seeing people as consumers, see, putting the material, uh, the the act of consumption. Uh, front and center tends to uh, tends to as you say obfuscate deeper human nature but i also think there's something about um a contraction of what our agency is a, a, a limiting of what we're capable of that comes down to the idea of choice right like we've elevated choice to be a kind of choice between options and we we've we've almost made that identical with the idea of having power to be able to choose between things is to have power and yet i think um what what i'm trying to well, big part of what i'm trying to argue is that actually there's a bigger there's a bigger deeper power in shaping what the options are not just in choosing between them the, the, the metaphor of a rest of a sort of restaurant like yes it's great to be able to choose between options but but that's a that's a very different level of agency to being able to actually shape what the menu is let alone get in the actual kitchen yeah um so yeah i wonder now what about uh, another wrinkle here is this idea of how some version i guess you could say of altruism that comes out right where 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 the consumer story has also uh infiltrated many um social justice types of campaigns or or many other types of seemingly alt altruistic types of uh um initiatives that will occur uh and where it becomes kind of this perversion of sorts where it's still about well how much are you giving or how much are you receiving based on this and it becomes a lot of this allegiance of sorts of well i'm, I'm giving all this money and i should get something back right or i'm giving this is kind of a reciprocal kind of thing you know how, how do we f how does that fit into where the tentacles of the consumer story has l launched into all aspects of our of our society including our you know philanthropic and and humanitarian yeah. uh sectors as well maybe maybe chat a bit about that as well yeah i, I love the image of the consumer consumer story as like giant squid that you've just <laughs> given <in> my mind <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think i think it's and so I think the obvious thing is is if you think about like uh, patron schemes and that kind of stuff, yeah. right? Where, yeah. where like benefits packages and that and and these sorts of things, and and you know they, the the simple truth is that they just don't really work very well as well, which maybe we'll come on to. But I think there are many more kind of uh, viable and strategically powerful ways for 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 charities and nonprofits to to operate and relate to relate to their supporters even if even purely on financial terms but um but i think that the deeper sort of darker version of this is in things like the effective altruism mm -hmm. movement mm -hmm. uh and the argument here is, is as i would describe it is like um you you do what is most effective and the right thing to do is to put money to donate to the things that are most that, that are proven in their effectiveness uh, and, and consumer logic, like sort of bang for buck, is seems like really hard to argue with. And, and you know, it's it's got some more people donating some more money, and that's good. But but I, I think the the problem with it is so there, there's a there's a thought experiment that, that one of the founders of the effective altruism movement uh, makes where he talks about um, the child drowning in the pond and how like you should you ought to take the child out of the pond. Uh, and and of course you should, but 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 what you don't see when you're working only in this kind of transactional kind of what's the bang for buck thing is why is the kid in the pond in the first place to to sort of pursue that metaphor right like and and I think Desmond Tutu was one of the first to to talk about this that mm -hmm. um like actually really we need to go upstream and figure out why there are quite so many kids in the pond in the first place and. Mm -hmm. And, and only if you get into relationship, if you get to into a deeper understanding of the systems involved, and you you actually put you don't just transfer money, you transfer power, 
mm-hmm. that you that you really solve this stuff. And I think that's um, that. If I were to sum up the 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 shift from consumer charity to to sort of a, a more citizen philanthropy, it would be about shifting power, not just money. It would be about power in the hands of those who are closest to the situations and, and actually genuinely involved in the situations rather than retaining that power and using the the sort of um, the screen of uh, of rationality of cost and of cost benefit analysis of impact analysis to to protect that power and retain the power in the hands of those who are making these calculations as opposed to transferring that power into the hands of those who are actually involved in the situations yeah it, it's a, it's this uh, piece of it that you mentioned earlier about um, you know interdependence right which is you know something that is uh, has been talked about by you know a variety of people, um, uh, including our friends Nicola Rehani, who's talked about this in terms of cooperation and, and interdependence. Um, I think she—I don't remember it at the moment. She uses a boat analogy, right? If we're all drowning, we all need to like do a part so that way you don't drown and I don't drown. There's like a whole like interdependence thing as opposed to just a reciprocal thing, which reciprocity is a is it has its uses in certain places, but it's not. <clears throat> You know the totality of, of how we understand you know social connection and relationships and yeah, I, want... I, I really like sorry if yeah. i may i really like the way um edgar villanueva puts it he's uh, the guy who wrote decolonizing wealth because he does mm-hmm. he sort of sees reciprocity and interdependence as being pretty closely related constructs but i think he thinks of reciprocity in a kind of bigger way mm-hmm. it's less sort of um transactional tip for tap reciprocity sort of direct reciprocity you give and i you give and i give you something back you scratch my back i scratch yours right. and more kind of um almost sort of societal reciprocity he's yeah. like he has this lovely language where he's like um uh i think it's something like 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 we are all givers and all receivers at different times and i may give now but i i know i and there is an and in a sense in that sense in that sort of this concept of reciprocity the independence and rest, the interdependence of reciprocity are kind of one and the same right yes i i i think that i think that that would be a, an interesting way to look at it because reciprocity and how it was originated was on a one to one uh, if you look at the work yeah. by trivers in the 70s re- reciprocity was that right it was one person does one thing for another person then you receive it back so you know you know i buy you the first beer but you got to buy me the next beer right or maybe i buy this round when we hang out but you got to buy me the next round that's the this implicit expectation which has become a a, a kind of mm, i don't want to say a global norm that's too too far to say but i think that is a norm in many places right yeah and, and it's that, a very restrictive idea of what <laughs> of what might yeah right what. or people have this idea with uh with uh this is a little bit of a tangent, but people have this idea of like if if there's a if there's six friends that go to a dinner, <laughs> you heard this, right? And if if everyone goes there and they they order you know uh, starter meals, appetizers, and everyone gets a plate, but there's the one guy that just gets a beer and maybe just nibbles a little bit on some bread. Everyone is paying at least an equal portion, right? There's this implicit understanding, right? That where you, know, you do your share, I do my share. But this person didn't really get anything, right? He got a drink and nibbled on some bread and that's it. So why should I have to pay, you know, when I didn't eat anything, right? And the idea would be socially, yeah, but you know, it's part of the group. Like you were one person here and people, you know, maybe uh in, in, a, in a half serious half joking way would say yeah but i don't want to do that and other people would say well you should do that right and it depends on the norms but i do think that the idea might be kind of what you're saying this kind of like bigger reciprocity of like yeah but you know maybe there's the next time where you do this and someone else does what you did so you know you're just paying it forward here right that's it yeah. you know you're just giving some like you know social credit of, of sorts um and i think different groups in different societies around the world have different ideas or ways of doing this. But I do think that concept exists. I do think interdependence is a, is a different concept uh, of cooperation. I think they're all included, but I think that interdependence probably works at a bigger scale, 
that yeah. that would be my 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 uh, how I would postulate that is that with bigger groups or bigger scale interdependence is much necessary because you don't have enough bandwidth or time necessarily to think about it in that way a kind of one to one um, it's a type of heuristic at that point where it's like okay yes like we understand everyone here is in a hospital and everyone needs to do the part or we all can't be able to you know there's a there's a there's a bigger uh, piece there but uh, maybe in in the example you're giving group reciprocity and interdependence are there's not that much daylight between them so <laughs> yeah i mean without going too far down into this i think i think maybe it's kind of interesting uh where egg is coming from in the in this in his, in his use of that language is is sort of from a from a native american tradition that maybe just doesn't doesn't even mm. He, he he wouldn't. When I talked to him about this, he he just couldn't compute. Well, because I was I was arguing much the same way. I was like, I was like reciprocity is just tit for tat, right? Like, I'd, and he was like, what are you even talking about reciprocity? Like, what what, I, what we build, what we what I built my whole kind of. Like, oh, interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, which which hence a really important point, right? Like the the kind of some of this stuff without kind of over like simplifying or but a lot of this a lot of these ideas that the sort of deeper ideas of interdependence and and uh and our kind of our our deeper agency and our ability to contribute and and the and the and the fundamental need to make these contributions is something that 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 some of the older civilizations some of the some of the indigenous peoples around the world are like Oh, you guys are finally realizing this, are you? <laughs> like, yes, yes. A, one yes. of my favorite authors is a guy called Tyson Young Caporter, that, that he's a, a Aboriginal Australian um, uh, philosopher, sociologist, mm -hmm. and he 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 often he's got this sort of lovely way of sitting back and chuckling and going, "Oh, you've you've arrived, have you, little brother?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, yeah. He, when he talks to us, it's like, "Okay, cool." It, it, it's very interesting where you have various anthropologists that will travel the world and they'll go to South America and they'll go to Southeast Asia and they'll go to certain uh, African countries and they'll they'll have these various tribes or sects or, or groups that are doing versions of this, right? already and they've been doing it for thousands of years right and so in the west i think that sometimes people try to paint it as well you know because this group has been doing it and we're just now figuring out there's a type of slight well they had it figured out so they must not that they're better but that they 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 got there first kind of thing and i think the difference is is that it's just a it's just a, a matter of of uh timing and again scale which is yeah, when when you're when you're scaling things in a cosmopolitan modern society, if you will, you know, other things become maybe I don't want to say more important, but they're just kind of important in terms of sequence. And then you kind of get to that maybe later. Maybe it should be the other way around. But and I wonder on, on, on that piece of things of how to how can we learn from other people uh, or from other groups um, that maybe are. Um, you know, have, have a different way of seeing the world or a different kind of worldview or different construct and then applying it in, in other other societies or with other groups if, if you know, we're trying to find those, those ways of doing things with each other. I do think the, the literature on this is, mm, I don't know if, I mean, if you talk to people that do this, they'll probably say yes, but I think that we can very closely say that cooperation and interdependence um, are things that are, innate and or maybe endogenous to what it means to be human as social animals, right? I don't think you can remove that. And yeah. I would say the same thing with, with empathy, although that's a different kind of emotion of sorts. You know, I think empathy is also there. Um, and so we're, we're, people are, are really complicated, right? Because individually we're super selfish, we're super out for our own gain. But in, in a context of other people like us or how we end up breaking out into groups, whatever that alliance may be, super motivated to protect the group. And there's a social component to that that we can see with other social mammals or other social animals as well. And so I, I wonder if there's a kind of innate aspect to it that says, yeah, I'm pretty sure we have some element of that, whether we're expressing all of it or we're indulging in all of it or whether we're engaged in all of that in ways that are helpful for others. You know, that may have some variance and probably does have some variance, but I think that there's at least the the parts are there, I guess you could say the the what do they say the hardware's there for for people to be um, empathic, cooperative, 
uh, compassionate, interdependent. And I think the variance is just how much that plays out um, in different contexts with different people. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd probably go one step further and maybe more specific and, and say, I, I, I don't think we are individually selfish, certainly by nature. I, I think I would argue, and what I'm arguing in the book, I guess, is that is that maybe there are maybe what I'd postulate is is sort of two core beliefs about humanity um, or two two sort of starting assumptions. The first is that, and maybe if I use the language of the book, the first is that we are actually citizens by nature, that we are we are collaborative, creative, caring creatures to to sort of slightly paraphrase your language, um, and that we can and want to get involved in making things better. That's a that's a kind of natural disposition. But the second and the thing I would use to explain how a lot a lot of what's showing up in the world right now is that we're inherently also storytelling and story dwelling creatures that 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 we and we appeal to those stories to understand who to collaborate with, who to be caring of, how to, how to do that, um, and, and how to be good, essentially. And, and the story that we've been surrounded by for the last 80 years or so is, is, is a story that says that, that like it's uh, most the family and, and, and maybe like the, the people who look and sound like you and, 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 but really it's about your own individual self-interest. So that it's the story that, that offers the, 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 that offers the the narrative of selfishness rather than the inherent nature. I think we're we sometimes now I've sort of named this for myself and I step back from it. I think it's almost it's kind of it's actually very Orwellian. Mm-hmm. It's like the story that we live in is basically one that says that selfishness is selflessness, mm-hmm. and and that that to me explains an awful lot of it helps you helps you understand how we can be the the species we are and that i believe we are and 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 that i think research like yours suggests we are as 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 we say collaborative caring creative but 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 how that can show up in such dramatically tragic ways yeah i would definitely agree with you on the second point for sure i definitely think that narrative and story is uh a major part of our cultural evolution. I don't think any sociologists, anthropologists, uh, biologists even would say otherwise, honestly. I mean, I think we see that um, way, 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 way back in our in our human history. I, I, I agree with you on the first point. I, I do think that there are, you know, clear indicators of uh, humans acting in, in, in their own interest, uh, if you want to say that's selfish. I worry always about any type of um, moral or, or ethical or value or virtual top spin that's put on things as you know, this kind of good, even if it is an Aristotelian kind of you know, higher good. But I'm not saying that doesn't exist. I would just say that there's, I would say we're a mix of both of those things. Because I think... Yeah, our, I, really, I love that. Our evolutionary nature tells us that, right? It's just trying to get to the next generation. It doesn't know the, any sense of morals that we have placed on things. It's just trying to do that, and it's doing that by any means. And that is doing it through cooperation. But as we know, that there's so many downsides. There's so many dark sides to cooperation as well. And so I would, I would say that I, I, I don't disagree with your first point. I do think it's, it's kind of like a bunch of things no, really dwelling in. That's really interesting. And maybe let me refine what I'm saying a little bit to be more specific in the in the discipline that you're offering that you're sort of challenging me with. I guess the reason why I'm saying what I am is that I think um I think there's a there's maybe a redressing of the balance in in how we understand ourselves because we have understood that that there is this sort of um default assumption of selfishness, I think, that 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 actually is a is a pretty unfortunate starting point in designing. As, uh, uh, the infrastructure of society mm-hmm. right like because uh, it leads us to a place where what we think where where we and and i think i think there's something lovely one of the reasons why i know you've interviewed um uh nicola Rione for this podcast and we've, we've sort of uh, alluded to her a little bit she, the the why i find her work so fascinating is because where it's drawing on a lot of the same research that underpinned the famous Richard Dawkins book, The Selfish mm-hmm. Gene, right? Yeah, like it, yeah. 
And, and yet, and yet, the title he chose to give his work was the selfish gene, mm -hmm. and the title she's chosen to give in her work is the social instinct. Mm -hmm. And I think that 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 sort of the, the implicit balancing of the of the stories in that I think is really important, particularly in this moment in time that we're living in, where, like, I mean, just to make this really tangible, we have this um, there's this thing in in the UK. Uh, uh, just recently where uh, uh, a website was launched uh, for people to offer uh, homes for Ukrainian refugees. Mm -hmm. And the website was designed for, designed essentially to, to, to receive about sort of 10,000 uh, offers of support over a few, over a few weeks. And, and it got 130,000 in, in two days or something and, and crashed, right? And, and the interesting thing is the reason this I find this so so interesting is that that almost two years two years ago almost to the day in the UK they launched a, a, a scheme called the NHS first responders to be national health service first responders for volunteers to be part of the COVID response on a national scale, and that that website was designed for two hundred and fifty thousand uh, people to to apply over like the, the the server traffic to, to deal with that over a, over a couple of weeks and that got 750,000 in 48 hours and that crashed and 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 you get all this and people are like, the memory's so short when the Ukraine homes for Ukrainians thing came out and it crashed everyone's like oh my god people's generosity is so amazing and like I'm sorry like that was it's literally two years ago can we just like maybe design for this mm -hmm. and so maybe that's where I'm coming from but I appreciate the kind of the precision that is required in these things and I am maybe a little little uh little too free with my language sometimes <laughs> no no i think i think it's good i mean i think both things can be true i mean i don't see selfishness as a negative term i know most people do i don't i try to divorce it of uh, when 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 speaking about it i guess from like a thirty thousand foot level in a kind of an abstract yeah. version I, I try to remove the morals from it and just take the the items on its own and i don't think that's necessarily a a, a good or a bad thing i think it is um i think there's a self sufficiency of wanting to not just survive but to to be able to get the best parts and i think as a result of that is where you have a lot of the cooperation and interdependence i don't think mm. it's because of some uh, you know necessarily moral good i think it i think as we've evolved um to live in 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 close proximity to each other and with groups and there's eight billion of us on the planet yes i think it's a cultural evolution piece right i think that's that has happened and that's fine that helps us not you know blow each other up as often and you know that's fine we, we need those i'm not saying morals are, are wrong but i i don't think at bottom though i think that's the start i don't think that's the starting point but i still think you can get there right that's the difference right i don't it's, it's not that you can't get there um you know, and I, you know, I just, I, I haven't, I haven't talked too publicly about it, but you know, the Ukrainian thing is, you know, in some ways it's very, I think people sincerely care. I think they do, right? I think people sincerely care about people being harmed and, 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 um, you know, you know, people are innocent and they haven't done anything and, you know, they're, they're being invaded and it's a terrible situation. But I also think it is just really obvious like it's an obvious thing right there's a bad guy that's attacking the good guys and they haven't done anything we must help them i mean it's not i think that narrative is really easy for people around the world to get and i think it's very easy for people to just be like of course i'm going to help them of course i'm going to give money of course i'm going to give you know uh, whatever i can because it's a it's an old and simple and obvious narrative, right? Because you could make this case of, well, why don't we do that for the 10 year war between Arabia and Yemen or the 10, 15 year war, civil war in, this, in Syria? Or, you know, the fact that Sudan had a, you know, civil, a, a horrible civil war and genocide for 15 years that split literally the country. And now there's two separate countries. All, you know, on and on and on and on and on, right? You see all these things that are happening and those things are less clear. They're more muddied. We care, but it's, there's less things that are involved. Obviously politics comes into play. And I think that this has a pretty easy, tangible thing for people to be like, that's wrong. They did that without, you know, or the, the Russian government did that without, 
you know, any, any, you know, provocation. I don't know. I mean, I hear you. I, I guess, I mean, just to unpack a little bit more of the, the ideas I'm working with and maybe the diagnosis of the moment in time, because I think mm -hmm. I, maybe I can express how I see this situation a little bit more and why, why maybe I see it differently. Like, I think, um, so what I'm arguing really is that we are, we are in, as I say, in the decline of the consumer story right now. I believe that I, I also argue that what came before that, uh, and before the two world wars in in the in the twentieth of the twentieth century, was uh, the dominant story was something like the subject, and the subject story said, "Keep your head down, do as you're told, get what you're given," because because the god given few know best, and they'll lead us to the best outcomes of society as a whole, and that that story fell apart because because. Like the, the industrial revolution, the rise of the middle class, there was, there was, you could you just couldn't sustain that that logic. And 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 it was out of the two world wars uh, uh, that I would argue actually to some extent resulted from the collapse of that story, that we that we that we constructed the, the consumer story as a as an alternative hypothesis for the for the, for how to how to create the best society. And what I'm really arguing is that what's happening right now is that the consumer story is collapsing under its own contradictions, much as the subject story did before. And 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 to some extent, I would argue, and and what's what's coming through, what's what's taking shape and could take hold, doesn't inevitably take hold, but could take hold, is what I call the citizen story, which is the idea that actually the best society results from the fact that all of us are smarter than any of us and therefore the right thing to do is to to contribute your ideas energy and resources to the pursuit of that best society and and critically to encourage others to do the same and to create for organizations and leaders to create the context where that's possible so bring back the 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 the, the current situation into that i do agree with you that it's a that it's a pretty um well for all that in certain parts of the world it's not seen like this and and there's deliberate cultivation of it to be seen otherwise it's a it's a pretty black and white phenomenon mm -hmm. but putin is very much uh, an embodiment of the subject story right he he has the, the bargain of the subject story is and always has been protection in return for obedience and mm -hmm. and and the, the 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 great man as 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 leader and savior and 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 father and protector and and that's very much what he the story he has constructed and and the reason why he's he's still like very powerful in and 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 the large, the majority of the russian population is is with him is because of the construct of that story for all there are significant proportions of the population who aren't mm -hmm. but the the thing about the the homes to ukraine's thing i think i think we're in a moment in time where like really quite a present moment in time where where the door is the doors that open into this space where we can be citizens where we can be where we can contribute where where the opportunity to contribute at a scale and on a level that's commensurate with the scale of the challenges we face is only just starting to open up to us and and the the fact that we're leaning into that isn't just because of it can't just be directly held up and, and actually I'd, I'd almost rather say maybe this is the point where it's got so real and and where that, that opportunity is starting to be offered that, that that's a muscle that we'll build and then we'll start to apply to these other situations and it's not so much that um the the that we are that we didn't care about those uh, about those other things because they were messier or more difficult it's but it's that it's that we still until now we still believed that the story that we were living in was kind of right and those things were and we could we could still believe that those were anomalies and sort of disruptions rather than rather than a fundamental demand to 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 enter a different way of being and so i i I guess I offer that not not to sort of uh, not to not to argue unnecessarily, but just to go. I, th I think if we see the moment in time as a as as a sort of as a crucible of story, as a, as a moment when the subject story is kind of roaring back and has its has its guises in America and in the UK as much as it does in in Russia, uh, and the consumer story is kind of is collapsing but but there are but but there's a temptation to defend it and rebuild it, and the citizen story is there. But quite difficult to step into because it isn't obvious and named. I think there's a there's a there's there's an opportunity and perhaps even a responsibility on people like you and I who are who are storytellers and who are working with this information to sort of go, well, what what is the version of this? What is the understanding of this 
from within a citizen frame rather than from within a consumer frame if we if we hold ourselves to that so yeah i hope that's no that that, that, yeah that makes sense i i i agree i have some i guess i guess you could say asterisks or questions about it but my understanding is is that yes after the wars right war one war two the the consumer story became dominant not a negative way, but I think it was based off of need, right? We had, I mean, literally, I mean, countries didn't exist in Europe, you know, everything was blown to bits all over Europe after World War II. <clears throat> Obviously, depression, uh, you know, in terms of not just economically, but also for people's uh, basic needs, food and shelter and clothing, you know, we're all, uh, people were left desolate, right? And and then obviously, you know, you, you had... um. Uh, disease as well throughout out, out the 20s 30s and 40s so uh, it makes sense right the consumer story well how do we how do we get things how do we build how do we build rebuild how do we have economic uh, um uh, yeah one, one of the stories i tell in my book is that is that my mum uh, my mum remembers her, her her family's first washing machine it was a, <laughs> right. it's called the hot point liberator right <laughs> like this this stuff, and this stuff is real no right? yeah, like, it's true it's true yeah yeah yeah, yeah, right. I mean, there's people that can remember a time before, yeah, dishwashers and a and a washer and 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 dryer in your in your house and and all those things, right? People are still washing clothes on the line by hand. Like, yeah, that wasn't that long ago. There's people alive that still did that. But the, but the point is, is that I I could see how the it was fertile ground for a consumer story that makes a lot of sense historically. And now it seems that we've kind of as we do uh, push all the way to the extreme version of that, and we're like, oh, this is like crumbling on beneath you know beneath us because of you know too much uh, there's too many unforced errors, right? We're, we're just kind of like chopping our own. Uh, uh, um, scaffolding out from underneath of us, right? And it's not working anymore. And and your your pivot is to the citizen story, which you've been talking about and elaborating on, right? Where we focus on, uh, you know, individuals and we focus on how we, we work together. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I do agree with that. Um, I guess my cynicism here is... Hit me, man. <laughs> I don't, not on your concept, but on people. Because if we take many of the things that happen, these things, I think for many people, and if you were to ask anybody, I think they would deny it. But I think if we look deeply, much of this stuff becomes about image, status, um, and, and things that I don't fully believe. I don't fully believe that people are sincere and authentic. So I think you could have a story where it is, yes, people are concerned about various you know, citizens or other people around the world, but I think that you could have degrees of authenticity and sincerity in that, right? I think some people would be true believers and they really would. And I think other people would, would, would not so much. Right. I think if something turns and it doesn't sit with their morals or their ideology or their religion or whatever, they'll say, no, I don't want to do that anymore. Nope, not into it. That's fine. I'm going to take all of the I'm going to take the 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 flags out of my profile. I'm going to take the boxes out of my profile. I'm going to take all that away because I don't agree with this anymore because it was one thing that didn't agree with their priors. I think that happens. I think we've seen that happen in other movements. Right. You know, somebody gets disappointed or something. Nope, not going to like that person anymore because, you know, they did one thing and we can never forgive them. And so I so I guess my thing on that is for some folks, what's the longevity of this? Right. Okay, if the if if the consumer story isn't enough, it's not about how much we're 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 um, being sold something and we need to buy something and always get it, whatever that looks like institutions and otherwise. Okay, if that doesn't work. This alternative you're saying could be, but I also think it's a way in which it could be perverted. I think it could be bastardized. I think it could be seen in a very sleazy way. I think it could be cheapened. I think it could be very negative too, right? And I don't think people would intentionally mean to do that, but I think we see pieces of that happen in in many other things, right? And and it, it doesn't have holding power enough. So I guess my question is, do you see negative sides of where this could go? the degrees of authenticity and what's the kind of you think staying power of, or the longevity of this? 
but and again mm. before you answer i'm not trying to be too cynical or pessimistic but i, I do i have seen this though in in certain occasions and it it is you know uh, disheartening i think yeah i mean maybe let me start by start the answer by maybe saying a little bit about the, the story that researching it for the book like really set me on fire kind of made me believe yeah, this, could yeah, really, this could really take off so this is what's happened with the Ty with the taiwanese government over the last decade mm. and, and there are reasons why taiwan might be like actually i think there are fewer good reasons why taiwan might be an exceptional case than 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 most of us might think it through the lens of kind of western exceptionalism but, but, but regardless of that go with me for a moment so go, you go back to 2020 go back to 2012 and taiwan was actually not far off where i would argue the uk is right now we had a they had a government who were who were broadly in a kind of uh slightly authoritarian tendencies slightly subjective tendencies but 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 actually but with a definite center of gravity in the consumer story they, they launched this thing called the economic power up plan and they said right basically said shush little people you 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 go shopping we'll sort the difficult stuff was was essentially the message you crack on because we know that's what you want to do anyway and um and a group of hackers uh started to organize and uh the, the, the way they were doing it was they, they were building websites that were parallel to government websites uh, where the data on, on, on all sorts the government were working from was, was made available to the public to comment on and debate on and vote on and so forth. And, and really, it was almost an arts project. They called themselves GovZero because all the URLs of the websites were, were g0v.tw instead of .gov.tw. And the way they, and they talked about themselves as forking the government, which is all was quite fun right but they they were basically kind of it was like i say it was almost it was real but it was almost an arts project it was kind of a, 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 a enabling people to imagine and and sort of quasi experience a different relationship between citizen and state and this kind of built momentum a little bit and then 2014 came and a trade deal with mainland china came to the parliament and the uh, and and a student protest kicked off students were quite active in gov zero uh, and they occupied the parliament and and the gov zero gang got a broadband connection in and started streaming across the country what the students were doing what they were doing was was debating the clauses of the trade bill in the parliament and so and energy started to gather around the protest and people were like oh my god they're actually pretty grown up and this is sort of what i thought the people who were elected to be there should have been doing but they weren't and and then and then the pressure started to come on the speaker of the parliament to beat the protesters out and he was a member of the governing party by political affiliation old guy like had had his sort of day in the sun and everyone thought he was going to beat them out but he didn't he said this is what this space is for like this is democracy and and that was like a super crucial moment so within, within six months i think there were municipal elections all over the country and uh politicians candidates who'd stood with the protesters were elected even though that in many cases they were not remotely expecting to be uh but around the same time, the, one of the leaders of the hacker movement got made a mentor to a government minister and various parts of the GovZero work started to be sort of brought into, into government. Within two years, there were presidential elections, the power changed hands and, and this, this person, Audrey Tang, who, was, who had gone from hacker to, hacker to mentor, became a minister in, a, in her own right. Uh, and then and then it was that group that led the country's COVID response, which was essentially based on tapping into the ideas, energy and resources of everyone. Like I say, I doubt like open challenge prizes, uh, uh, open data on everything, trying to encourage citizens to know what was going on and, and inform each other and be part of this kind of national effort. And, and even to the extent where they created a phone line where any citizen could ring in with ideas for how the country's response could be better. And, and and like the story is a six-year-old boy rang up with an idea and ended up on the national press conference because he said I, I won't go too deep into it but like the the spirit of that and then and then the reason why i wanted to go into that is then to then to say like i the way i see that is that that is uh 
citizens organizing to show what the role of the citizen in 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 the state in the organization of society can and might be and then government accepting that and moving into it and then and then a sort of shared seeking for that and that's that to me is a real uh, encapsulation of the kind of the healthy the sustainable the kind of uh, like a real a really powerful example and and, and in a way for me um the 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 thing i would counterpose with that that juxtapose with that is actually um is q anon because i think i like and if you look into q anon like the 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 offer of participation the offer of agency that is in that and it's also in uh, the offer of belonging a similar offer of belonging that's that's powered things like the nra for a long time like these things are the, the greater danger than uh, for me than the kind of um, co-option of this instinct is the is is how this instinct expresses itself if it is not acknowledged and validated and and supported by because I th- I would argue that the, the 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 way this stuff is showing up in the world in countries like the US and the UK at the moment is actually um, like that is deeply, uh, it's deeply scary. People are so hungry for agency, that and and so denied agency by the by the structures that ought to be offering it to them, and that, and that actually would benefit dramatically by doing so. That it's that it's that it's sort of coming out in these really dark ways, um, and 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 the worry, the deeper worry I have in this moment in time, is that we're. I, I mean, I mentioned, like I alluded to it right at the beginning, but I, I, I was reading um, President Biden's speech in, War, in Warsaw the other day, and this, this sort of the, the story he's telling himself and the world about how the how the Russians are being beaten is one that is fundamentally rooted in in like it's the bit it's the big governments doing the economic thing that that is that is that is winning the whole fight, and it's like. There's no space for the citizen in that, and there's no acknowledgement of the role that Zelensky and the and the Ukrainian citizens, but also all of us around the world who've been that the anonymous collective who've hacked the Russian government and the and the and the people who've been tagging restaurants in Warsaw in in St Petersburg and Moscow with accurate information and the and the people who've been using Airbnb to transfer funds and like there's no acknowledgement of the of the role that, that the citizen energy has played in this and that. I think is is really dangerous so i'm so like i say i'm less worried about like the the potential for this to be uh maybe co-opted and, and i agree with you like there, there will be different levels of it there are always different levels of different stories but but and, and that's that's a healthy dynamic because it makes it possible for the next to emerge and like i don't see the citizen as a kind of final solution right but but i think right now where we are suppression is the real danger yeah i would firmly agree with you on that and and the last bit that you said there about how this is turning to darker places of agency and what's so um you know uh, attractive about that for people people that would normally not even consider this you know 10 years ago five years ago is alarming um <clears throat> uh, I, I really liked the the part in the book where you talk about Taiwan as a kind of case example or whatever. It was a really nice case example. Um, and I think it is very powerful. My, I guess my counter to that is always, you know, Taiwan's a unique place for geopolitical reasons, number one. And number two, you know, it's a, it's a small island country, right? Um could that be scaled let's just say a, a to a place like you know england or the united kingdom i don't know i think possibly yes um could it go to a place like the united states i'm less sanguine about the the potentials for that just because of how uh, obstinate and rebellious the United States can be most times, right? People can't agree on anything, right? And they don't trust information. They don't trust, you know, they don't trust each other. You know, it's, it's not just, you know, you know, uh, uh, us versus them. It's, you know, to be part of us is to be against them. You know, it's not, it's, it's, it's that thing now, which is unfortunate. I, but, but then when as you were speaking about it now, <clears throat> you know, 
kind of what you're saying about Biden's speech, uh, which I agree with you on. Um, it's all you know, role of big government and economic, you know, sanctions here and how we've been helping here and all these things. Okay, um, I agree with you. One of the, the 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 last things in memory that I think was unique was how President Obama did that in 2008. He made it about people. He really made it, and not like in that political, like you know, folksy way of like it takes all of us to like make change. Like it, it was, it was that, but it was really sincere, and you could see how it was sincere in the United States by just activating young people, grassroots community organizing, and and winning states Democrats hadn't won in years. You know, I'm talking many election cycles. And it was, it was a really electric place, right? It was a really, it was a, it felt kind of sort of what you're describing, right? Some yeah. version of that, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously people didn't, you know, hated Obama and they disliked him and things like that. That's fine. But you saw many people, people that never voted before, people that never got involved in politics before. Um, and what's unfortunate is that I think he knew this, and I think he tried, and I think you know, there's only one person, but it was, and he's an electrifying figure, but it, it, it didn't really have legs after that, right? Even though he continuously said, it's not just me, right? It's everybody. You have to maintain that. It started to wither. And I know people now that liked Obama and maybe worked for the campaign that are fooling around with QAnon and, you know, they were wearing the MAGA hats and stuff like that because, and some people are like, how could that be, right? Like, that's just so opposite. But I think what you're saying is right, is there's this lack of agency that people don't have a part to play, but they don't, and, and I think people, not only do they, they don't want to feel wanted, but they want to contribute and they want to contribute in an authentic way that means something. And so I, I think that's the power of what you're saying. I think the frustrating thing about it is, is well, how do, how do you have, you know, if, if citizens are together people and there's a type of citizenship that you talk about, how do we do that at scale and keep it with sustainability through time? I, you know, this is kind of longitudinal yeah. kind of thing. How do you feel? Because that those to me are the things that are going to uh, make break it apart of sorts. And so, how how do you see ways to try, you know, to do that or to incorporate that? And it's a lovely way of putting it. I mean, I just to say, well, just to say a couple of tiny asterisks to use your phrase sure, back sure. to you. But firstly, just the point that, like, yeah, Taiwan's pretty small, but it's not tiny, right? Like, I, I mean, sure. I, I get that it's, but then you know, twenty three million people, like, yeah, yeah. all roughly. Same population as Australia. We're not talking about just. I mean, uh, just for your listeners to, to, and then and then the second thing I guess is this. Uh, like, I, uh, well, I forget. Like the 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 the, the Obama thing. I think is really fascinating. Um, I am um, one of the one of the thinkers writers that I really admire. Actually, is is Van Jones. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And um, and his book Rebuild the Dream is 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 very interesting. If people haven't come across it, and and the sort of central diagnosis he makes in there is that is that uh, the the kind of great mistake, as it were, was that organizing for America, the kind of the the grassroots organization, got then brought into the DNC, right? So it became yeah. became an insider, and so it there wasn't corporate, there wasn't, essentially, right? Yeah. And, and and critically became inside because what you needed uh, what uh, and is is an outside game. You needed to use Van's language. You need you need an outside game to hold the space, mm -hmm. that, and make the space that then uh, and 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 give people the agency without without pretending that they're actually directly making the the laws. And I think that's a that's a kind of big part of the answer to your question. I think is that is that this requires. Uh, an acknowledgement of the of the need for outside as well as inside operation. To, to go a bit further, though, I think I mean, and and so, but also maybe step back a little bit. I think the the diagnosis that I'm making and the the offer of this frame of of, of an analogous shift from consumer to citizen to the shift that happened in the 20th century from subject to consumers, I think it helps us understand the scale of the challenge, because what happened when we shifted from subject to consumer 
was an incredible level of global scale like institutional innovation right like out of the second world war we got the world bank the imf the european union starting as the european coal steel community we got the oecd we got like in the uk we got the national health service like the the the, the structures that are created to kind of hold and buttress and, and carry that story that's the that's the kind of challenge to 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 make this sustainable that the as your as your question your uh, is is pointing to that's the kind of level that we're looking at i mean i think i think we're starting to see some of those things taking taking shape a little bit um i think uh one of my favorite uh, and there's some campaigns that are, that are pointing in this direction there's a really interesting campaign in canada um for what they call uh what the guys are calling a democratic action fund and what this would do is it would create enough uh citizens assemblies every year uh so a citizens assembly in case people listening don't know is is essentially where a, a representative sample of the population say a, a, what's called a mini public uh, like a hundred people representative of the national population randomly selected come together and deliberate on and make recommendations on a on a key policy issue um so so this this canadian proposal is that there is to is to create enough citizens assemblies every year that within a five-year period every citizen of canada would either have been part of one of these things directly or would know someone who had and what that does at a narrative level is it, it, it at an institutional level and at a narrative level is it is it creates a, it creates a different relationship between citizen and state it says that we are all part of making the decisions of state and i think that is uh that's a, that's one really interesting example. Um, the 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 an idea I put forward in the book is 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 like what if so if you conceive of the of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a as a sort of as a as a sort of human constitution of the consumer era, something that's very focused on the individual, but is but is a critical but uh, like supporter and an enabler of of the kind of consumer freedom. What might a renewal, an updating, a, a reinvigoration of the of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights look like for this era that was actually crowdsourced and facilitated by the the, the amnesties and, and Oxfam internationals and and, and 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 disaster emergency committees and so forth of this world. But that that's the kind of that level of uh, of structure I think is what we need. And I think it is starting to emerge. So I, I don't take the question lightly, but I but I do think it's 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 happening. I think I mean I think we also need to look at like how might we how can we bring this kind of logic to bear on the 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 institutions that have become enormous in our societies, like the like the social media giants, like the tech giants, and and how might we bring bring a kind of citizen vibe to bear on those so that they are ours rather than rather than private ownership or, or maybe not necessarily out of private ownership but but we have power in them it comes back to this statement like it's a, it's it's almost like the, the 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 sort of apotheosis of consumer logic was that uh, was that that story about the clinton ad advisor and and the sign that, that it was in clinton's office that said it's the economy stupid mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. the, the the thing for the citizen era will be it's the power stupid mm -hmm. like that's what that's how that sign needs to change yeah no i i i fully agree with you i have two threads here so i guess i guess they're sort of connected too um some people listening could say Oh, okay, John, we get it. We get it. You want people involved. Nice. Okay. But isn't this just populism, right? Isn't this Bernie Sanders, right? Like everyone, you know, the people's like, you know, a party or whatever it was. And, you know, going to all the here in the, in the States, all the Rust Belt States and all the working class people. And, you know, he was very, 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 you know, progressive on any social issues and things like that. And, you know, et cetera, and taking it to the one percent, and isn't this just populism? People getting involved to like do away with consumerism and and to just be in, in uh, an active participant and, and sort of connected with this is we have small, uh, some small, well, you know, small meaning small in terms of like not a national thing, but um, you know, 
uh, groups such as unions, which you talk about in the book as well. So yeah, there's this kind of how, how is the citizen story and the, the the project that you're ascribing to here not you know what we understand with populism, uh, kind of a, a left quasi democratic socialist populism. How is, is it is it not that? How is it different? You know, is there some kind of affiliation there? You know, what do you, I guess, say to that kind of stuff? And incorporating kind of the unions and how they work. I think it's, um, I guess what I'd say is maybe that's the, that's the political tradition that sort of got sniffed closest to it. But this is a lot less about having enemies. Okay. Um, and like, and, and treating it as if this is a sort of, uh, that the existing situation is a kind of oppressive uh, or a deliberate oppression constructed by the few against the many. I really, I really dislike the kind of the the many, not the few kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I think the um, for all that I understand it completely, and 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 actually, in in there are moments right when protest and and is is really the right thing to do. I'm down with that. Um, but but I'm I guess what I'm thinking the way I see this and your your prompt to think about unions I think is right like I think t too often the the role of a union in in the in the current moment is to reject something or 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 fight something rather than propose and 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 create something and so like we've done I've done some work with a teachers union here in the UK and and it's really been about going like how might we reclaim our role as actually like uh imagining the future of what teaching looks like 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 creating the 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 idea of who we are what who we are as teachers and what we what we believe education might be rather than just being a kind of um an insurance product uh and and a sort of and a defensive wall like i think and and, and if you scale that out i guess what i'm saying more than uh i guess what i'm saying really is that if we all uh, i'm less interested in sort of anti-capitalism and post-capitalism and those kinds of things since uh, all the time you're just you're still defining yourself against the thing that you're trying not to be right like you're the problem with anti-capitalism post-capitalism is that they have no they have no positive frame of reference they're just rejections of something and and that and what you end up being is just a sort of what what you're fighting really whereas what i'm i guess what i'm offering i think is a way of I hope is a way of thinking that maybe flips the telescope a bit and just goes like, what if in any given situation, any given role, any given organization, any given like a CEO or a, or a union activist, like your, the role we are, the role we occupy is of, uh, is one of kind of enabler, facilitator, kind of seeker of ideas and holder of space rather than kind of, rather than attacker, aggressor kind of, uh warrior like i think that i think that is different um and maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's it's manifested more i i in some ways the one bit of your question that i i i don't have a kind of reaction against is is um is the word populism right like i i'm i'd be pretty happy to be described as a populist in some ways <laughs> and it's like the people I, I do believe in 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 people and i think that that's a, that's that's fine i just i don't see it as a as a as an aggressive antithetical definition of that so much as a kind of yeah mm -hmm. start from where we are version well i think the danger with populism uh Traditionally, I don't think you're saying this, but the danger with populism is that you have perversions of that. We see that. I mean, Trump did that that whole song and dance too. I mean, he did populism in that in in a in a, in a negative way. And I think what either way, whether it's the uh, you know if it's the way that's you know progressive left people in the United States use, or you know kind of more far right people use populism. It always, I go back to intentions, it always feels like it's preying on people's needs to score political points, right? You know, and, and I don't ever really believe it. I don't really buy it. Um, I feel like progressives are helpful in some ways. I think that we need to push, 
You know, we can't just be too stagnant, right? And I'm saying that as someone that's pretty moderate, pretty centrist, right? I, I do think we need people that do push and say, okay, we can't just keep, you know, treading water here, right? We do got to push. But I think if left yeah, we, to the... We've got to have a minimum wage. We've got to have a, like... Sure. A, we've sure. got to do something on climate. Like, I'm totally down with that, right? Yeah, right, 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 right. I, I, I hear that, right? And I think what happens is on the on the progressive left, it becomes, well... You know, you know, let's just, you know, write the blank check. It doesn't matter. And, you know, let's let's talk about taxing the rich. But we know that's never going to happen, um, at least not right away. Maybe downstream it could. And it becomes a like a wish list. Well, if, if we don't get everything, then we're not giving you anything. Right. And that's just I don't think a feasible way to work in general. And then on the far right piece of things, it becomes a lot of a lot of lies being fed to somebody, right? We're going to help you. We're going to give you this. We're going to give you that. We're going to give you that. None of that really, it's it all typically ends up happening is tax breaks. Okay. Um, which hurts our debt in the long run anyways, much like the left tries to overspend and hurts our debt anyways. And then it becomes a lot of culture war stuff. Right, it's just all that stuff. Right? You know, we care about, you know, um, what. Pick, yeah, name, those things, those sort of cartoons where there's a yeah. hundred kittens and ninety-seven are taken by one guy, and then he's like, "Watch out, that guy wants to take one." Of your three. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly what it is. And so, I guess my whole thing with that is there's some dangers to populism. I think on both sides here, right? But I guess the 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 one piece of this is connected with that is there is i think a, a through line here that you're saying is I, it really resonates with me about how do people have uh desire or want for being active and participatory in in, in their community in their society in their politics in their you know whatever 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 category or context i guess i wonder here that it, that how many people are going to say, yeah, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to work for this. I don't want to do more work. I have my family. I have my job. I have other things I'm doing. I don't want to do more. Like, I'm not an activism person. I'm not a, I'm not someone that wants to engage on this stuff. Like I'm fine just collecting my check and maybe voting in every four years and, you know, do my thing. Like, I don't, I don't really care. I don't care enough, I guess, you know, how how can i think there's a substantial amount of people like that there's a substantial amount of people like this sounds great and there's some good people that could do that but like not everyone wants to do that like how do we how would you say your the citizen kinds of mindset or project how does that reach to 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 all people especially folks that would say ah cool but i don't really want to do the work i don't want to get involved what would you kind of say yeah. to folks like that well, I mean, firstly, I'd say I, I, I think that that is, that is, there's a, there's a real validity to that challenge, not least because what we're, the, the place we're starting from is deep in the consumer story with 10,000, three, anywhere between three and 10,000 messages a day saying, just stick to your own shopping, right? Like mm -hmm. that's like, we've got to remember that that's the context from which we're building this. So, so, so it is a challenge. I mean, I guess. There's two things I would say. Firstly, um, uh, there's lovely, lovely metaphor that like citizenship is a muscle you build, not a cup you empty, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. and when, and it's like any muscle, when you start exercising, you actually start enjoying it and start like looking in the mirror and, and, and liking it and wanting to do more of it. And, and that's, uh, like there's some really lovely evidence, um, there's a thing called rock core, which started in the States and then came to the UK and has been very various other places. And the model is what they do is they, um, they give, uh, the only way to get a ticket for a really exclusive gig, uh, really exclusive concert or whatever is to do four hours of, of voluntary action of four hours of community action. And, and it's directed at young people, get people, get young people into community action. And what they find is that 90% uh, 90, 90 of the young people who do this have never done community action before, and their, their sole motivation is to get the gig ticket, right? But then something like 80% of them then go on to do more community action that isn't rewarded. Mm -hmm. So it's like even four hours is enough to start building the muscle. So there's some really interesting stuff about like how you how you create the openings. Mm -hmm. The second thing I would say is is to refer you again to that something like the Democratic Action Fund in Canada. Like you you're not necessarily asking everyone to do this all the time. Mm -hmm. You're just saying like what are the structures we could build that would actually frame the story differently and give people a role.
And then the third thing, I guess, is just to say, like, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be all of us all the time. It's, it, it doesn't have to be, it, it's just, it's got to, it, we're not talking about wholesale shift. What we are saying is that the, the, it's probably going to have to come with some supports, right? Like there are, there are, there are enabling conditions, and we have to acknowledge that that we're starting from a space where people are people are working hard. Too many people don't have enough money to be able to to have the space to think in these ways. That's why I'm I'm a I'm actually a really big fan, and and I'm in contact with uh, with Michael Tubbs and the and the Mayors for a Guaranteed Income movement. I think that 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 sort of thing is a is probably the sort of third part of the answer, which is like some enabling conditions are going to need to be created for some of this mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. No, I, there are some pretty good like cross-party, like across the across the divides arguments for something like a guaranteed income mm -hmm. that that are very different. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I wanted to say in, re in response to you is that I I think um, one thing the populists. Uh, have done really well i think is frame a lot of their messaging right like the mm -hmm. the and and this speaks to a lot of what we're talking about the idea of like be part of making america great again mm -hmm. in and in the uk it's even more pronounced like the line that won the brexit referendum the the message that won the brexit referendum was take back control mm -hmm. like yeah. Well, that is speaking to a deep hunger for people to have agency in the world right mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. directly yeah, no, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it, it sounds strange, but you know, slogans do have a, some power to them. I mean, there's some there's some really good ones. I mean, they make America great again was, you know, just, you know, Reagan's 1980, you know, slogan all over a redux. I mean, it wasn't that unique. But it was the way, you know, I mean, Trump packaged it. And it was, you know, very, 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 very successful for a lot of people. Um, and it's interesting because if you kind of get past the, you know, bombast and, and, you know, awful bullshit in which he packaged those things and, and just the kind of grandiosity and sort of narcissism, you know, he was trying to tell people, I think this is a charitable reading, but I think he was trying to tell people like, you know, get involved and be proud of your country, yeah. you know, and, 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 and tell your neighbor and everyone else to be proud of your country. I don't think there's that much difference than... I mean, when I listened to Biden's State of the Union address a month or so ago, it was very, very, very pro-American, patriotic, healthy nationalism kind of thing. We're going to build here in America, have this, build this here, look at all these things, look how great we are. I mean, there's a there's a line, right, of, okay, you tip this way and people love you and you're seen as some, you know, altruistic, you know, wonderful, democratic, you know, hero. And you tip the other way and you're a xenophobic asshole, right? I mean, I think that there's a, there's a line there. I mean, they're both getting at, you know, kind of the similar themes, right? How do you, what, what you're saying, how do I have purpose? How do I have uh, uh, actionable activity with things? You know, things like that, I think are, are really, really important. Um, and I, and I agree, I think some of the examples you give in the book and ones you gave here, if people are able to have a sense of, of, uh, I don't want to say purpose, it's not entirely that maybe a little bit, but more of, oh, well, you know, the four hours to do the community service wasn't too bad. And I got to see, you know, my favorite, whatever. Okay. I could do more of that just because, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I agree with that kind of stuff. I, I guess I want to, I want to focus on one thing here that we've, we mentioned, I wanted to ask about, cause I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts here um, is, so you, you said something, we have to be for something and not against things, right? Which I totally agree with you on. I say this every week, right? I, I firmly believe in that. And, and I guess my thing about that is, I think it's very lazy, right? And I think it's very reactionary to be against something, right? It's just, it's easy to just kind of shit on something, right? Like, oh yeah, you know, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this. This happens all the time in the United States. It's very obnoxious to me uh, because it's really, people have a lot of creativity or they have the, they have so much unlocked potential and that kind of anti attitude just pushes all of it down. Right. And it really frustrates me because it's like, you're better than that. Like you could be, you could be doing so much stuff you could be creating and, and building and things like that. I guess my question here is in trying to do something right or, or be, you know, kind of very active in that way. 
how how do how do you see the role or the place for reforming or 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 improving uh institutions that we currently have because i think what many many populists will do or maybe other people in extreme versions of things will say we just got to tear it all down and start over we got to burn it all down we got to scrap it we got to restart and i don't think so i don't i don't think that's how we do it i do think reforming institutions and using institutions in a pragmatic way especially for large countries especially for large communities is a way of doing that right you know if they're based around people in them that are committed to that so i guess how do you see in terms of this doing you know, being, being being for something and actively being for something how do you see that in, in using that for reforming some of the institutions do you think that's possible maybe not what are your thoughts of it i guess on the institutional aspect yeah no i absolutely do i think i mean so a friend of mine uh, posted the other day. He, he's a he's a civil servant uh, in the he works for the UK government, and he just posted a thing saying there are twenty nine thousand uh, people working in essentially in policy making in the UK. Uh, what would if you had a couple of million quid, uh, a couple of million pounds? What would you what would you do with them? uh would you like throw them out would you <laughs> um uh and, I, and my answer was i would i would put them all through facilitation training i would i would i would put them all through through a kind of through a set of training that was about like uh asset-based community development or kind of art, art of hosting the, the sorts of training that's about understanding how to uh enable and bring the ideas and energy out of people rather than uh doing it for them rather mm -hmm. than seeing your role as the servant or or the hero yeah and i think and then and then if there's any money left over give them each like a a, a little bit of seed funding to go and to go and like support uh experiments around the country and build stuff that works because mm -hmm. i think that that is the fundamental shift for me is so in the, going back to subject consumer citizen, the lens, the lens I see everything through, like many of the institutions of our age, uh, well, many of them were created actually in the subject era with a kind of command and control function mm -hmm. to them. Yeah. Most have been reinvented to a greater or lesser degree in the consumer era to be service providers, and but still really to be behind the to be to be behind the camera to be to be the sort of the the decider of what's offered and the and the expert going back to the effective altruists the people who decide what the right thing to be offered is and 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 i think that that shift for of the institution the leader the organization into a into a kind of facilitator role is is the core of this i mean i have one of the examples i give in the uk we have the we have the bbc the british broadcasting corporation right which is one of those institutions that's always accused in the in the us of being somehow socialist when it's <laughs> but, but but it's like the BBC was was created very much in the subject era. Like it's a it's a deeply paternalistic organisation. It has the mission to inform, educate, and entertain. Like brackets the proles, right? Like it's a, <laughs> and 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 the and, and it's really struggled in the consumer era, because there are loads of models for creating content for consumers, mm. and and a lot of people think we should tear the thing down and throw it out because like the market will, we can just create a different thing. I, I don't think so, I, but I think that the opportunity is to evolve it into the citizen era. And I, my, my little thought starter in some of the work I've done with the BBC is like, what if it wasn't the BBC? What if it was the NBC? What if it was the movement for British culture? And it was facilitating like, and running processes where like people were the, we were, we were the talent scouts and we were the crowd funders and we were the, like, there were so many ways that we could be involved in that process. Uh, and, and that is the sort of, reform i imagine it's pretty drastic reform by the way like it's not it's not like it's not reform of the sort that's like well you know cut the budget a little bit and fire 20 percent of the staff and, and and train three of them it's it's like reconceive of the role of the organization and and fundamentally reimagine its role but it's but it is reform mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that maybe where you and I might differ on this is I would probably want with certain institutions to do that gradually and, and slowly and a little progressively. I think too much change too fast is not a good thing. But I think there are other places where that could be the case, right? Where you could do it kind of, you know, very thought out, good plan, you know, you beta test it, and then you could do that pretty quickly. Um, you know, but that's the only disagreement there would just be the pace of it, right? And and I think for some things, you know, I, I think it should be a, a, an ongoing discussion. I, 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 you talk about, I guess, towards the end of the book about these uh, different modes. Let me see if I can say all these. You know, mode one was tell stories, which is great. Mode two is gather data. Mode three is share connections. Mode four is contribute ideas. Mode five is give time. Mode six is learn skills. And mode seven is crowdfund. How, just explain these modes. And we've well, talked and mentioned a few of them at different points in conversation, but just as a kind of like, I guess sort of linear thing, what is the, the idea behind these modes and how can these be helpful in trying to enact some of the, you know, citizen model that you've been describing? I guess, I mean, I guess the, the model I'm offering for organizations and institutions is to say, like, if you think through the lens of, uh, being more participatory opening up to people then the three questions you need to ask yourself are what are we really trying to do in the world and then having asked that question and come up with a decent answer how can we involve people in doing it so we're not just doing it for them and those seven modes what we call the seven modes of everyday participation are just really intended as like thought starters for how for what what organizations could invite people to do and, and enable people to do so mm. it might be like in that bbc example tell stories would be like can you give people a platform to to share their stories of what cult, what british culture means to them or gather data might be like a sort of citizen science projects to to monitor the health of the coastline or or share connections might be like, can you can you recommend three people who could be part of this? Or you know, like it's they're just sort of prompts really to go to 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 show that 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 it's not that it's not the, the thing that people can do isn't only to to consume or feedback. Uh, people can people can get involved in ways that are really good fun and 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 simple and joyful, without this being about like. One of the ways this is always this is often perceived. What I'm talking about is often perceived as like throw open the doors, like hand over the keys to the castle. It's <laughs> it, and it's not that. It's yeah. like throwing the doors open and just just walking away is as much of a kind of abrogation of responsibility on the part of the organisation as as only letting people consume or 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 feedback after they've consumed is a kind of withholding of responsibility. It's mm. that's the that's the that's the idea. That's the joy of it. Yeah, no, I, I think that, I think that's great because I mean, there, I I usually am pretty allergic to, uh, you know, manualized, you know, step one, step two kinds of things, and and thankfully they're not. It's not that right. It does feel as more of these prompts as more than just like do these seven steps. You know, it's, it's so I I really value that. Um, I guess I guess the the one of the the last questions I have for you is. You know, you've written a, a, in some ways, I guess you could say revolutionary book, or it's a very passionate book. It's a book that is very forward thinking in very good ways. And I, and I, and I, I could imagine many people may misunderstand some things or whatever. And, and that's true of any book, I guess. But what, what is the thing, I guess, that you would want people to take away from it and say, yes, you got it. That's exactly what I was trying to say. You got exactly the message I was trying to say, what I was trying to say. Um, what is the big thing that you want people to kind of take away from, from the book? I think if only one thought were to stick with people, it's, it's like this notion that all of us are better than any of us. Mm -hmm. It's like the, 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 the way we can really solve our problems is to tap into that and to encourage that contribution and and you know what that that is already what is happening mm. and i think i think maybe i'll just reiterate that thing about what's about what's been going on uh, about the, the 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 war in ukraine like uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the vladimir vladimir zelensky on on the 24th of february made a speech where in russian 
uh, where he explicitly said, I I'm speaking to the citizens of Russia, and he said, not as president, but as a citizen of Ukraine, mm. offering you, like, and he talked about brotherhood and, 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 for, and, and shared heritage and, and all of these things. And then he turned to the citizens of the world, and he said, and I need your help too, because Russia will not, the Russian government won't let this be seen, but you can help me, you can help make sure this is seen. Uh, share it, post it, post information, da, da, da. and he gave people a role. Mm -hmm. uh, and he spoke. He both spoke as a peer and and as a citizen, rather than as a as a formal leader. Right. Uh, and he gave people a role, and he asked he asked for help because he knew that he needed it. And I think that kind of notion that that by tapping into and seeking to understand what what everyone. Can contribute is a hugely powerful act, even in the face of what looks like kind of overwhelming odds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I I fully agree with you, and I think that there's if you give people action and you give them uh, some way in which they can participate for something for themselves and people around them, people really are hungry for that. And I I, I do believe that uh, the citizen model you're putting up is a, a forward-looking and, and future-oriented model that I think uh, many people around the world need. The, uh, the book is called Citizens, Why the Key to Fixing Everything is All of Us. Uh, where can people find the book and where can people find yourself and all of your, your other work? Uh, so you can find my website at uh, uh, John Alexander, no H in John, uh, johnalexander.net. You can find out uh, more about the work there. Uh, and you can get the book, I, I think and hope, pretty much everywhere, but certainly on bookdepository.com. Uh, and I may well be in the States uh, come the fall. So uh, nice. look out for info on a tour. That, that's 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 fantastic. Um, highly recommend the book. I highly recommend everyone pick up and uh, and, and read it. Uh, John, this was such a fun conversation, uh, and really felt just that. I I, uh, I I I always love it when you know I prepare and you know, have some, you know my outline and stuff, and and I can just kind of have it there, but really just have a conversation and just talk about the content and the ideas, and I love that stuff and. This is a really good conversation. I, I really, really enjoyed it. And I, I can't say enough thanks for you coming on and, and having that wonderful conversation. Thank you, man. I learned a lot, so I appreciate it too. All righty. All right, thank you.